Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Temples as they become more complicated in plan have repercussions for how the superstructure of the temple also evolves the north indian temple the latina temple the nagara temple as it's called is composed of a series of multi-storied pavilions but here they've been compressed and because of the strong vertical lines it gets called latina lata meaning creeper the idea is exactly the same as a kutina temple a dravida temple or a south indian temple whatever you choose to call it this is the shekhari style of temple building in which a complicated plan of the sanctum is manifested in equally complicated ways on top where you have one main spire and miniature spires cascading down its sides this is one way to resolve the accordion like folding of the sanctum kutina temples or south indian temples are built of simple models of edicules the simple hut that we saw is the module that makes up the sp the spire of the south indian temple seen in buddhist reliefs at kanganhalli in the 2nd century bc to depict a mansion for the buddha a multi storied palace built out of simple hut like edicules with a hut on the terrace and seen in the dharmaraja ratha at mahabalipuram in the 7th century ce 800 years after that relief is the same idea a multi storied palace made up of small hut edicules the square ones being called kutas and the longitudinal ones being called shalas at mahabalipuram are a series of five boulders sculpted into temple like forms in the 6th century ce parallel with developments that you find under the guptas in south india you have a different visualization of what a shelter for the gods will look like these rathas as they are known at mahabalipuram can be thought of as an architectural showcase of different forms where somebody who wishes to build a temple can order piece meal saying i want so many of these shalas so many of these kutas i want them composed in this way so what you see in the ratha on the right are miniature versions of two of the rathas that are built here the long ratha you see in the middle and the ratha you see to your extreme left are the shala and the kuta respectively these these will be miniaturized and form the different stories of the temples there is a lot of clever word play in these temples as well where you have a shape an apsidal shape also called a gaja pritcha or the back end of an elephant which is placed right next to a sculpture of an elephant with its back towards you this is the kuta the simple square hut that is one of the edicular modules of the south indian temple and here you see it in the corners of the two stories on top the kuta never really goes away from any of these temple forms in fact the first free standing temple so this is now a constructed temple at mahabalipuram not carved out of single boulder but made up of different stones the short temple as it's called is made up of these long shalas and these square kutas at the ends note there is no amlaka on top but a big hut from there within 400 years you will get to a temple like the brahadeshwara temple at tanjavur built by raja raja chola in 1010 ce note the scale of this temple obvious 
when you notice that there are two people sitting right at the base. This is truly enormous. But compositionally, it's exactly the same as the Shore Temple. A whole series of tiers made up of kutas and shalas till you have a hut right on top. The Brihadeshwara Temple is unusual in that the temple sanctum reaches these enormous proportions. Keeping in with the trend of the 11th century in India, where everybody is building temples larger than their neighbours. But this trend is soon reversed and we shall see with South Indian temples that the sanctum of a temple actually remains quite small in later years and it is the gateways that grow in size. Notice the two gopuras at the extreme right, the two gateways to these temples. They are quite small in size. The Brahadeshwara temple, like a lot of temples in South India, is made up of a number of enclosure walls. As temples grew prosperous and cities around them grew prosperous, there was a whole economic and social order in which temples were at the centre. Temple became more important than ruling dynasties. Sometimes temples would patronise kings as opposed to kings patronising temples. Temples, in fact, became the centres of cities. As you can see with the Meenakshi temple, enlarged through successive centuries, till in the 17th centuries, it becomes a whole series of enclosure walls encompassing multiple cities that have grown up around it. The sanctum at the middle is quite small, but with each successive enlargement of the settlement, the gateways rise and become larger than ever before. And so what start off at the inner circle being small gateways, by the time you get to the outer gateways, have grown in size. The enlargement of a city is a marker of its prosperity. And as the city grows, as the temple city grows and becomes more prosperous, the gateways get larger and larger. These gateways, as they are on the outsides of the sanctum, display more and more creatures that are not necessarily directly divine, but sometimes semi-divine, belonging to worlds that are beyond the Devloka. Here you see a South Indian temple where the innermost centre, the central shrine, is modest, you might have a small kunda, but it's the outermost gateways that are the most massive. Here, what you see at the bottom right, that small shrine with a golden hut on top, is the main shrine. And successive enclosure walls, as they grow outwards, have gateways that grow in size. The earliest prescriptions for a temple plan suggested that a temple had to be constructed, that is to say the sanctum of a temple had to be constructed in a way that you had 16 equal squares arranged in a grid like this. The wall thicknesses of the sanctum would be exactly half the open space left for the sanctum. And so the area that's being shaded are the wall thicknesses and what you have in between is the sanctum of the temple. Naturally, if the sanctum is x wide, the wall thicknesses are x by 2. So they are half the width of the open space. Now, as the temple plans become complicated, you have projections on all sides like this. And these projections will bear on them statues, reliefs, idols of various kinds of deities who are inside the sanctum. So, for example, if this is a temple of Vishnu, on these three sides, you will have relief sculptures that show various avatars of Vishnu. In the inside, you will have the main icon or statue or idol of Vishnu. This spot will be marked by a vertical axis and this vertical axis is manifest in the form of a spire. Now the question that arose was if the prescription of wall thicknesses to the 
area of the sanctum was to be maintained which is to say if that ratio of the walls being half the width of the area in between was to be maintained how do you accommodate these kinds of projections because if you have these projections the thickness of the wall has changed this is not half the open space this projection on the main side is called a bhadra the corner of a temple is called a karna and so you had two opposing schools of thought one of which was that if you have a temple sanctum you could measure things by a system called bhadra vyasa which means you hold this proportion to be sacrosanct if this is twice the thickness of the wall and you scoop out elements from the corners in order to maintain a proportion so this becomes your wall thickness this is called bhadra vyas because the bhadra is the measure that is held to be sacred the other system you have is of course the karna vyasa in which if you have a sanctum like this and if you want to have projections the pro bhadras the sizes really don't matter you can have projections like this as long as the proportion is maintained at the corners so the karna maintains this proportion of being half the size of the sanctum and you can build up many kinds of projections on the outside and therefore these temples are naturally much larger as you have these projections and they lead to very interesting kinds of building forms in principle all these temples will start becoming diamond shaped in overall form but what will vary is if the temple is karna vyasa the sanctum will be small if it is bhadra vyasa the sanctum will be much larger these proportioning grids which are used to mark the proportions of the sanctum of a temple are very often extended outwards to also extend to the sabha mandapa which is much larger but the same proportioning system is very often used this is the sanctum called the garbha griha this is the mandapa or the assembly hall which is in front this transitional zone which is also very important in temples is called the antarala and so a typical temple plan by the 10th 11th century will be a garbagriha or a sanctum a small antarala a big sabha mandapa and sometimes if this is not adequate you will have a whole series of mandapas in front each one of them meant for a specific different purpose most temples will face east but in exceptional circumstances depending on the deity and other factors temples might face north west or south south being quite rare a temple as we saw the walls of which the bhadras become more and more complicated they start having a lot of folds in plan the shikharas also start getting more and more complicated as you have more projections on the outside and so complications in plan also means complications in section and in elevation the two main types of temples that we talked about the latina temple 
will have a number of stories each of which represents a set of houses with a small griva or neck above an uttarvedi and an amlaka on top. These will be shaped as curvilinear spires and these vertical bands which are called latas give this temple type the name latina. In the Kutina temple which we haven't seen yet but which we will see now what you have are all these stories are actually marked as horizontal bands and instead of having an amlaka on top you actually have a kuta or a hut placed right on top. These bands are composed of alternating edicula called kutas and shalas and what these kutas and shalas are we shall look at in just a minute. But here the idea that this is a multi-storied palace composed of many hut like buildings becomes very obvious and this is the kind of temple you will more commonly see in South India. A kuta is a small square hut like this and we shall see examples of this at Mahabalipuram whereas a shala is a long hut, a longitudinal hut shaped like this. When these are made in miniature they are called edicules. Very often you will have dormer windows or windows in the roof depicted on these shalas. In South Indian temples you will often have a kuta a shala, a kuta, a shala in alternating bands. The shalas will be marked by these dormer windows which you see from the side. The two types of Latina temples that are commonly found are called the Shekhari and the Bhumija. The Bhumija is primarily found only in western India, in southern Rajasthan, western Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat and Maharashtra. Remember that the sanctum has a number of projections on all sides because of which the plan becomes complicated. This whole thing will be set on a basement story or a plinth. So when you have a spire with your amlaka on top, one way to accommodate this is to have a simple spire and corresponding with all the projections you have lesser spires. And as you project down the middle you have smaller and smaller spires each one of them capped by an amlaka till you end up with a cascade of spires. This is called shekhari because of all the shikharas from large to small as you go down the temple. In front of the temple separated by an antarala will of course be a large mandapa and the roof of the mandapa can be built in any way. The other type that you commonly find the bhumija type is again a temple on a plinth with lots of projections in plan. A cornice band over here and with the amlaka on top and here what you have instead are the central bands are marked by elaborate carving on all sides and in between 
as you have a starship plan you have a number of small stories with edicules of the shikhara built up like this and this mode and of course you will have a mandapa in front with a roof perhaps of a completely different type this where you have these horizontal bands which are marked off by these vertical latas this is called the bhumija type bhumija means being born of the ground and these represent different bhumis or different grounds on which you have a multiplicity of shikharas the dravida temple is completely different because the dravida temple being the kutina temple because the sanctum itself is quite simple and square you might have a few projections but what the temple is marked by are really a number of kutas and shalas that make up horizontal stories very often these kutas and shalas will diminish in scale as you go higher lending a sense of being taller than they actually are and right on top you will have one large hut sometimes multi sided which is capped by a roof this hut might be square eight sided or 12 sided this makes your south indian kutina style temple unlike south indian temples north indian temples do not have concentric rings of enclosure walls these temples instead chose to go upwards the temple sanctum the garbhagriha and these temples became taller through time somewhere the idea that this was a multi storied mansion that represented a vertical axis of divinity was not lost but these vertical forms took on many regional variations the commonest of them in north india was what is called the shekhri which is what you see in the kandariya mahadev temple at khajuraho built in 1025 ce it's the temple on your right this kind of temple is on a very high platform in the middle is the main shrine and at the four corners are subsidiary or smaller shrines this kind of temple is called panchayatana temple or the temple with five bodies or five parts on the very high plinth one enters the main temple through a set of stairs that lead you to the sabha mandapa in front the mandapa usually has a corbelled roof behind which is the main shrine with the tall pyramidal shikhara this kind of temple called the shekhri is very prominent because the main shikhara has on the sides a set of cascading and diminishing shikharas decreasing in size as you go downwards another completely different variant on the north indian temple is what you find in western india such as at the temples at dilwara these important jain temples built in the 10th 11th and 12th centuries are finished completely in marble on the inside set as a cluster of temples from the outside it looks like a set of very uninspiring low domes but these domes conceal on the inside the most lavish of marble decorations all kinds of suspended ceilings corbel domes brackets and columns create the composite intricate carved marble that these temples are really famous for many of these designs are replicated in jain temples after this period all across the country the apocryphal story about these temples because of their fine carving is that the king or the patron who patronized the artisans who carved the marble promised the artisans that whatever they could 
drill out, scoop out or excavate out of the marble would be weighed and an equal amount of gold would be paid to the artisans. A story that is quite obviously fabricated but is one way to explain the absolutely gorgeous marble carving everywhere. But on the eastern side of the country in Bengal, what you have is a completely different temple style, not like the Shekri of North and Central India, not like the Jain temples in Western India, but this is what you find in Eastern India, a style called Kalinga. And it varies from the other temple styles largely because of its profile. This is the Sabha Mandapa or actually the lesser Sabha Mandapa of the famous Sun Temple at Konark. Where the actual shrine would have been is completely lost. It would have been behind what you see here which is just the small entrance hall. The whole plinth which is high and raised is set on wheels that are supposed to be chariot wheels for the sun. The sun is the major deity who was worshipped in this temple and these wheels would put his chariot along. The whole temple is likened to a chariot. The wheels have almost become a state emblem of the state of Odisha now. What survives is what you see in the picture on the top left. It's just the portion in front. The massive superstructure that would have been behind is completely gone. So what you see in the picture on the right is just the Sabha Mandapa that you see in the drawing on the left. The actual shrine which is not Shekhari because it doesn't have those cascading spires is built in the Kalinga style. A reconstruction from Percy Brown is given below. A typical Kalinga temple looks like this. While the overall composition might be linked to the Shekhari, the melon-shaped curvilinear spires are very distinct for this kind of temple. The Lingaraj temple in Bhubaneswar is probably the most famous standing extant temple of the Kalinga style where the blocky curvilinear profile of the shrine can clearly be seen as opposed to the narrow pyramidal scheme of the Shekhari this kind of style articulated by the vertical bands also has horizontal striations that mark horizontal stories. The Amlaka on top is enlarged to almost be the width of the temple spire. A third kind of temple spire that you see is the Vesara which is a hybrid between the north and the south, the Latina and the Kutina. Vesara literally means mule and this style is called Vesara because it has attributes from both styles. So while you have an arrangement of horizontal bands like a South Indian temple, the little edicules are firmly of the North Indian type. Such temples are largely found in Northern Karnataka. You then have other variants like the Bhumija where everything is reduced to horizontal stories. This is a temple called Tamri Surli in Goa. But this is not purely Bhumija because in the Bhumija you have strong vertical bands and we'll see an example of that. This is much closer. This is a Vesara style temple with an, a logic of articulation that's like the South Indian temple but yet maintaining the profile of a North Indian temple. And it is on temples like that that you very commonly have small representations of other kinds of temple spires showing the audience that yes we are aware of other kinds of temples being built but this is the regional idiom in which we build our temples. The pure Bhumija style is something that you see in Rajasthan in the south that is to say southern Rajasthan, in Gujarat in western Madhya Pradesh and in western Maharashtra. A style that is intimately associated with the Yadavas of Devgiri. This is the famous Gondeshwar temple at Sinnar 
near Nasik. Built in the 11th century, this is a fine example of a Bhumija temple. Again, a Panchayatana temple built on a high plinth with four subsidiary shrines at the four corners and a mandapa that is bang in the middle of the platform. The temple is characterized by the spire which rises in the corner on the left. And what you notice about the spire is there are vertical bands on all four sides that make it a Latina temple. These bands representing vine creepers or verticals. And in between them, you have horizontal tiers of edicular modules. And it is this arrangement, these vertical bands connected by horizontal stepped tiers that is called Bhumija. It is this kind of temple that you find built under the Yadavas more than any other dynasty. And so to quickly recap, you have the Shekhari kind of temple on your left, the Kalinga type of temple on your right, and the Bhumija temple in this slide. Notice how all the spires have minor changes and these changes are very much dependent on the plans of these temples. Because Yadava style temples tended to favor plans in which there were lots of small offsets, the plan of the temple became almost lozenge or diamond shaped and in order to accommodate that planning, the Shikhara had to be of the Bhumija type. In Ranakpur, in the 14th and 15th century, this is close to Mount Abu in Rajasthan, you have another set of Jain temples, but here the temples look more fortified than they have looked in previous times. When you look at the temple, it looks like a cluster of temples, but it is in fact just a single temple on a high plinth approached by a big staircase, reminiscent more of military architecture than of temple architecture. The cloisters around the periphery of the temple platform all have shikharas which makes it look not like one temple but multiple temples. In the finest of Jain carving traditions, the temple is carved with exquisite carvings in marble. And the plan of the temple looks like this, where again it is a Panchayatana shrine with four subsidiary shrines on the four corners, one major shrine in the middle. But it is not just the actual temple which has offsets now, it is the whole platform on which the temple is, has been built that is unfolding and manifesting itself in all directions like a mandala.